I'm going to um, talk about my book, American Eden, which came out uh, two years ago in June. Um, and I'm just going to jump right in uh, and start us in Manhattan in a September during a wave of mysterious fever. This September I'm talking about is not now, it's 1797. A young doctor was rushing down a New York City street to the bedside of a 15-year-old boy. The doctor's name was David Huzzick, and he was just 28 years old. He entered a townhouse at number 26 Broadway, and he was shown to a bedroom where he found the boy in the grip of a terrible fever, likely typhus or scarlet fever. Huzzick found that the boy was unconscious and then delirious, and then unconscious again. He dispatched the boy's, uh, dispatched a courier to bring the boy's father home from a business trip to Connecticut, and he sent the boy's distraught mother out of the room so she wouldn't have to watch her son die. Huzzick knew that his more experienced colleagues would try to bring the fever down with cold cloths pressed to the skin, but that hadn't helped the boy. So instead, he chose a risky measure. He chose heat in an attempt to break the fever without killing the boy. He drew a steaming bath and he mixed a botanical remedy into the water, Peruvian bark made from the cinchona tree native to the Andes. And next he sprinkled in smelling salt to try to stimulate the boy's circulation. And he lowered the boy's limp body into the bath and waited. Within minutes, the boy's pulse quickened and he began to regain his senses. Huzzick repeated the treatment and then he swaddled the boy in warm blankets to continue the sweating. And he carried him to a bed where the boy slept deeply for several hours before awaking past all danger. Now, Huzzick refused to leave the house that night. He was afraid something might happen to the boy, but he permitted himself to doze in a nearby bedroom after the hours of anxious effort. And suddenly he bolted awake to find the boy's father kneeling at his bedside. It was Alexander Hamilton. As Huzzick later recalled the scene, Hamilton took Huzzick's hand with tears in his eyes and thanked him for saving the life of his precious eldest son, Philip. And in that moment, Huzzick became the trusted friend and advisor to one of the nation's most famous and powerful men, but his medical intuition did more than forge a bond between a founding father and a young physician. It moved Huzzick one step closer to an idea he had quietly been nursing for three years. After the night he saved Philip Hamilton's life with the help of a medicinal plant, Huzzick spent all of his spare energies, and he was an extraordinarily energetic man, as you'll, you'll hear today. He spent all his spare energies launching the nation's first public botanical garden. Why a botanical garden? Well, Huzzick grew up during the British occupation of New York City by, uh, during the Revolutionary War, and he was surrounded by blood and death and disease. And in this chaotic world, he began to dream as a teenager of becoming a doctor. In 1786, he enrolled at the age of 17 at Columbia College, and he also apprenticed himself to a doctor uh, who worked at the New York Hospital. He uh, loved, above all, Hezek fell in love with dissection and anatomy, because it was the only way you could see inside the miraculous human body. Hezek studied at Columbia, studied with the doctor at the New York Hospital, and then uh, moved to Philadelphia for advanced medical training with the greatest physician in the United States, Dr. Benjamin Rush, also a signatory of the Declaration of Independence. Huzzick came to deeply admire Rush, as did many of Rush's other students, and he stayed friends with him until Rush's death. They corresponded regularly, even though they disagreed on medical matters very often. They stayed very close. And Rush once signed a letter to Huzzick, uh, your friend in the Republic of Medicine. Now, Huzzick admired Rush so much that after Rush's death, Huzzick had this companion portrait painted of himself. Uh, this is a portrait that has, uh, as you could probably see, a bust in the upper right-hand corner. 
That is a bust of Benjamin Rush, Huzzik's beloved mentor. Uh, and Huzzik had this portrait painted to, to show that he was still listening to the guidance of his mentor, even after his death. One way that Hazek came to emulate Rush was uh, to go to the University of Edinburgh for ad further advanced medical studies. That was considered the greatest medical faculty in the Western world. And Hazek uh, studied, uh, uh, Rush had studied there like many other doctors. Rush had studied uh, medicine and botany there. And it was in Great Britain that Hazek discovered his life's other great passion, which besides medicine, which was botany. Uh, while he was in Edinburgh, he took medical uh, classes. He attended the uh, clinics. He followed doctors around the clinics and hospitals. But what he discovered in Edinburgh was that for doctors and medical students and, um, uh, and patients all across Europe, Botanical gardens were classrooms, encyclopedias, pharmacies, textbooks, all rolled into one. Husek also learned that no one really knew just what made a given plant effective against a given illness. And no one knew how to identify new med med uh, medicinal plants in the wild. There was no surefire method for doing this. And Husek, Husek caught fire with a passion to help change the situation. We don't really think of botanical gardens today so much as medical gardens, research institutions for medicine. But this was an age, the late 18th century, when most of the medicines, the vast majority of medicines known to doctors came from the plant world. So Huzzik moved to London for a year uh, after his year in Edinburgh, and he studied botany with some of the greatest botanists alive, including the famed explorer and president of the Royal Society, Sir Joseph Banks. And Huzzik went on courses, uh, botanizing excursions in the wilds around London, uh, which still existed at the time, um, with a teacher named William Curtis. And this is a, a depiction from one of Curtis's textbooks of a botany class that he was teaching. Um, Huzzik's not in this picture because this picture predates him by several years, uh, but this is exactly the kind of class he went on. And I know that all you gardeners out there dress like this when you're out uh, gardening on a Saturday. Well, Huzzik returned to the United States in 1794. He had a cutting edge medical education and he was also inadvertently one of the best trained botanists in the United States. He set up a medical practice in New York City, uh, which was then located, the, the city was about 60,000 people. It was located in the very tip of Manhattan Island. Uh, and this map is from uh, the 1790s, right when Husek got back. So you can see that a map of New York City only needed to be to depict to the very tip of the island because the rest of Manhattan was fields and groves and, and farms. That inset is a, a picture of Columbia college then as it was then called and that's where Huzzik was appointed a professor of medicine and botany even at the young age of 25 because he had this advanced education in these fields. Huzzik was an incredibly charismatic lecturer and uh, public speaker and his students adored him. He began to become the most popular medical professor in New York City and soon was drawing students from out of town to, who wanted to study with him. Uh, he was very charismatic. He could be a little bit scary. He was very funny. And his students loved him so much that they wrote down even his jokes in their notebooks. And we still have some of these notebooks at the Columbia Medical School archives. Um, one of Huzzik's students wrote home to his parents about Professor Huzzik. Uh, he said, quote, when Professor Huzzik aims to please, he is as good as the theater. Um, wonderful teaching evaluation for any any of you who are teachers. Well, Hasek told his students that the United States deserved doctors just as skilled and knowledgeable as Europe's, but he found it so frustrating to have no botanical garden to teach them in. He lobbied friends and colleagues and politicians for the money he would need to create this research institution. He dreamed of creating a public botanical garden run by the government for the benefit of the young United States. 
Columbia promised some money, didn't come through with it. Albany didn't come through with it. Federal government didn't come through with it. So he decided in 1801 to go ahead with his own money and found a botanical garden. Now, today we have many more effective treatments. Uh, we have a wider array than the East at the time. Um, but in Hussock's day, the humoral theory of the body was still at the tail end of its popularity. And according to this theory, uh, sometimes you would have excess blood. If you had a fever, that was a common diagnosis, excess blood. So what did you do? You used uh, bloodletting tools such as this one to relieve the body of that excess blood. Huzzik did not approve of these treatments. He, he knew that with more research, uh, gentler and potentially more effective treatments could come from the plant world. He also loved surgery and, uh, as I say, anatomy, dissection. He, he engaged in many surgeries during his career, but he was determined to find treatments that wouldn't actually kill his patients, which bloodletting sometimes could do to patients. So in 1801, he bought 20 acres of land, three and a half miles north of the northern boundary of New York City. So if you see this map here, uh, which was actually done by one of Hussock's nephews, a uh, very talented engraver and map maker, you can see that New York is labeled at the very bottom of Manhattan Island, and the Botanic Garden is way out of town. And to get to his property, which he bought with his own money, he was so determined to create this institution. To get to his property, he traveled up this country road along the spine of Manhattan Island, and the road called the Middle Road. And he would ride his horse or take his little carriage up there. And there he began to go on a spending spree. Now, imagine this piece of property at the heart of Manhattan Island. It was covered when Hussock bought it with mountain laurel and viburnum and violets and grand old oak trees. And he began to, uh, well, he preserved some of the native species there. He began to uh, ask friends, colleagues. He wrote to everyone he could think of for plants, specimens, seeds. He wanted every kind of plant he could get his hands on, not only medicinal plants, but also uh, ornamental plants, because who knew what ornamental plant might not have medicinal properties that had not yet been discovered. He also wanted commercial, commercially useful plants, plants that could be used to dye cloth or make cloth. Um, he collected an arboretum that was absolutely extraordinary. He preserved the, the big trees that were there, and then he added trees from uh, many different uh, parts of the world that would grow outdoors uh, safely on Manhattan Island. For the plants that he couldn't grow outdoors, he began building a conservatory, the likes of which few Americans had ever seen. One way he also collected plants was to go out with his Columbia students and uh, collect plants from the fields of uh, Long Island, of Manhattan. He even collected plants down in New York City and the, along the ditches in New York City. Uh, and he rode across to uh, New Jersey and collected plants there. And this is a specimen that was actually collected by David Husick and labeled September 6, 1806. And this plant was is still in, amazingly, in the herbarium at the New York Botanical Garden, uh, where they have several dozen specimens that came from Husick's garden. It's quite amazing to look at these plants 200 years later. And that is Huzzik's handwriting on the label. Um, Huzzik wrote to everyone he could think of, as I said. Um, one of the people he wrote to was Thomas Jefferson. And H Jefferson didn't know Huzzik. Uh, but Huzzik was not a shy man. So he wrote to Jefferson and asked him for plants from the gentlemen when they returned from their expedition. Uh, he was talking about Lewis and Clark, and he was very bold to ask the President of the United States for some of these specimens. But he told Jefferson, I, I know you are passionate about botany, and I have the beginnings of a collection of, for a botanical garden. Jefferson ignored him. He wrote a very uh, polite and uh, noncommittal reply. Um, but Huzzick uh, didn't give up. He, he had proudly told Jefferson that he was successfully raising cotton on Manhattan Island. Uh, he had grand dreams for the United States, uh, ways of lessening the dependence on other countries and lessening the dependence of the North for cotton on the South. Well, as I say, Jefferson 
uh, ignored him basically. And uh, but Hesek was a very determined man. He never gave up. He just kept writing to everyone else he could think of. This is his conservatory. It was 200 feet long and 20 feet high, and there was nothing like it uh, anywhere in New York City. And there closest thing to it was one uh, private conservatory outside Philadelphia at William Hamilton's estate, the Woodlands. Huzzick filled this uh, central greenhouse and flanking hothouses with plants from all over the world. He had plants from uh, Japan, China, Peru, Persia, Egypt, the Cape of Good Hope, and on and on. And when visitors walked in to this, uh, to this conservatory, they were enveloped, they said, in a swirl of colors and aromas. And there were plants there they'd never laid eyes on, kumquats and figs and even a coffee tree. Uh, Hezek had every single plant he could get his hands on. And when I showed uh, botanists at the New York Botanical Garden, his plant lists, which have survived, they shook their heads in amazement at what this man had accomplished using his own money on his own initiative at the dawn of the 19th century uh, on Manhattan Island. Well, because of his garden, Huzzick began to become famous. He worked on it for the first decade of the 19th century. Um, and at the time, he was also publishing medical treatises, editing one of the first medical journals in the United States, teaching at Columbia, um, seeing patients in his clinic and doing volunteer work at the um, at the um, prison and at the Alms House. He was incredibly energetic and he was also raising a large family over these years. Well, Huzzick began to become famous, as I say, and he started to draw the attention of the likes of Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, he got praise from Sir Joseph Banks, um, James Madison. Two of Napoleon's botanists came to Manhattan to study with Huzzick at his botanical garden, uh, the Elgin Botanic Garden, which he named after his father's hometown of Elgin, Scotland. So Huzzick be begins to become famous. Uh, when the Marquis de Lafayette came to tour New York City, Huzzick showed him around. When Alexis de Tocqueville came to tour New York City, Huzzick was one of the ones who showed him around. He began to become very well known. And it's hard to realize now that he was, because most of us had not heard of David Huzzick, uh, he was one of the most famous Americans who was not a politician. Of course, the politicians were far more famous. Uh, but Huzzick was so famous that uh, paintings were done of him and uh, busts and commemorative coins were struck in his honor during his lifetime. He had uh, the greatest honor in the world that a botanist can receive paid to him by another botanist, which was uh, that the Scottish botanist David Douglas named a genus of North American wildflower for Hussack, Hosakia. And uh, that's David Douglas. You may have heard of him because he's the man for whom the Douglas fir is named. And Douglas said that Hussack was the Sir Joseph Banks of America for his collecting and his uh, pursuit of botanical science and education. Today, almost no one has heard of David Hussack and his pioneering botanical garden is buried under one of the most iconic urban spaces in the world, Rockefeller Center. His land became Rockefeller Center. And I'll talk a little bit later about how that came to be. Um, Huzzick became so famous that in uh, 1835, at the age of 66, when he suffered a stroke and, um, and fell into a coma, newspapers from South Carolina to New Hampshire wrote bulletins about his condition and offered prayers for his recovery. And upon his death, uh, obituaries were published saying that he had touched and helped thousands of people through his medicine and his civic work. But as I worked on David Huzzick's story, I and worked my way through the archives, I began to realize that um, founding the Elgin Botanic Garden was just one of the many things Hussack did for New York City and the Young Nation. In addition to founding the Elgin Botanic Garden, Hussack co-founded uh, the New York Historical Society, the city's first museum of fine arts, the city's first museum of natural history, the city's first mental hospital, its first public schools, its first school for the deaf, its first obstetrics hospital, um, is for subsidized pharmacy for the poor, uh, 
and on and on. It, he was an incredibly important man in the founding of civic institutions in the early United States and particularly in New York City. And I came to realize that he began with his botanical garden and he ended by helping make New York, New York, uh, one of the nation's greatest cities for the arts and sciences. So I began to become a little bit obsessed with this man um, as I read his papers. Uh, I ended up going to over 30 different archives in the United States and Europe on his trail. I wanted to find absolutely every scrap of paper I could that would, um, would bring him back to life, that would show me the life he led, what he did every day, uh, how he thought about science and medicine and the arts in the young United States, how he thought about his family. And I eventually uh, spent, well, I spent many years on his trail. And one of I did was uh, make a pilgrimage to the town of Elgin in Northern Scotland, where, as I said earlier, his father had come from. Uh, his father emigrated from Elgin, Scotland to fight in the French and Indian War uh, in the mid 18th century and then settled in New York City. And while Hazek was studying at Edinburgh, he made it his own pilgrimage to Elgin. Um, he went in a carriage. I drove alone on the wrong side of the road, trying to avoid sheep and stone walls. Um, I drove through the mountains and found this beautiful little castle where Husik had stayed for several weeks with uh, a uh, the laird of the castle, who was a friend of one of Husik's relatives. And when I got to the town of Elgin, I, I went to the historical society and. I told them what I was doing there and they got the phone book out from behind the counter and opened it and it was filled with Hussocks. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have time on my trip allotted to start contacting people, um, but it was it was lovely to see his uh, family name right there um, at, all around in the town of Elgin. Well, I spent uh, probably the better part of eight years working on his story. Um, and what I realized after I began my work was that Hussock, if anybody did know him, know that name, they knew him because he had been uh, friends with Alexander Hamilton. Uh, when Hussock was laying out his botanical garden, that was exactly the time that Alexander Hamilton was laying out his country house, the Grange, in northern Manhattan near the tiny crossroads village of Harlem. And Hussock, uh, Hamilton would sometimes stop at the halfway point of the island from his uh, townhouse in the city, his law practice in the city. He would stop at the Elgin Botanic Garden and get plant cuttings and horticultural advice from his friend uh, and physician, David Hussock. Uh, and Hamilton uh, said, something kind of funny in a letter to someone else around this time. Uh, he said he was a terrible, terrible uh, horticulturist. Um, and the way he expressed this was he said that uh, horticulture, quote, is a pastime for which I am as little fitted as Jefferson is to run the helm of the United States. Uh, but Hasek wasn't only Hamilton's friend and doctor, he was also Aaron Burr's. And so when Hamilton and Burr got embroiled in their war of written words in July 1804, culminated in the duel of July 11th, Hussock was a logical person to serve as the attending physician. On July 11th, Hussock stepped into a boat at the edge of the Hudson with Hamilton and Hamilton's second, a lawyer named Nathaniel Pendleton. They were rowed across the Hudson to New Jersey, where dueling was also illegal, but it was prosecuted less stringently. And there was a dueling ground, a rather popular dueling ground, uh, uh, beneath the town of Weehawken, a little way up the cliff from the river. Pendleton and Hamilton got out of the boat and went into the underbrush, and they left Hussock behind, out of sight of the dueling ground. They left him there so he wouldn't be an eyewitness in the case of legal proceedings. 
Um, I tried often to imagine what Hasek experienced as he was standing there waiting for the sound of pistol fire. He didn't know which of his hired friends he would find wounded or dead. He waited and then he heard a shot and he heard another shot and he raced through the underbrush to the dueling ground. And what he saw there, he said he would, he would never forget until his own dying day. He found Hamilton lying half cradled in Pendleton's arms on the ground, gravely wounded. At first I thought he, he was dead. They got him down to the boat and began rowing him across the Hudson. And Huzzick said afterwards that it, it, it felt like an eternity before he could get Hamilton, before he could find a pulse and, and feel a heartbeat uh, and hear his breath. Um, Huzzick couldn't do anything. Hamilton's spine was injured. He had a bullet lodged in it from Burr's pistol. And Hamilton was in terrible pain. And as Huzzick probed the wound, Hamilton fainted and Huzzick, Huzzick gave up. Um, they took Hamilton to the house of a family friend on the New York side of the Hudson. And Ham Hamilton, Hamilton's family and friends began to gather. And Huzzick was helpless. The next day, he was there with the family friends when Hamilton died around two o'clock in the afternoon. Huzzick was asked to perform the autopsy on his friend, which I think must have taken great courage and fortitude. He cut into his friend's abdomen and he traced the path of Burr's bullet and under his fingers, he could feel the little spikes of shattered bone in Hamilton's spine. Huzzick was, Huzzick was devastated by Hamilton's death. He admired Hamilton probably more than anyone else in the world. But Huzzick lived by a principle of strict medical and scientific neutrality. He, he wrote a friend in Philadelphia at the American Philosophical Society. He wrote this friend, he said, quote, science knows not party politics. This principle of neutrality kept him close with Aaron Burr for the rest of their lives. They died only nine months apart. When Burr fled to Europe after yet more scandal several years later, Huzzick was one of the people to whom he wrote asking whether the coast was clear for him to come home. Uh, when Burr was in Europe, he entrusted the care of his very, very ill adult daughter, Theodosia, to Huzzick's care and wrote him impassioned letters saying, you know, this is the gravest concern of my life, Theodosia's well-being. Burr was worried about Theodosia, but he was not going to waste his time in Europe. And he went and met many great people, uh, intellectuals and artists in Europe. And he also, I discovered, uh, to my great surprise, by looking through Burr's eyes at, uh, sorry, looking through Huzzick's eyes at this man we think we know, uh, I discovered that Burr was a passionate botanist, a amateur botanist and horticulturist. Um, when he was visiting Paris, he made repeated trips to the great botanical garden there, the Jardin des Plantes, to visit with botanists and consult with them on particular plant specimens. And while he was there, this is now about 1810, he wrote to Huzzick um, this incredibly flattering letter. He said, I have here a list of American plants that a friend of the Empress Josephine is trying to procure. He's Burr told Huzzick, quote, you know better than any man where they might be had. And Burr even said, I hope some of them are already growing in the Elgin Botanic Garden. Uh, Burr wrote this letter at just at the moment when Huzzick was finally achieving his dream at the Elegant Botanic Garden. In 1810, the state of New York finally heard his pleas. He had been going up to Albany over and over and over trying to convince the state legislators to 
to fund the botanical garden, to purchase it and run it for the citizens of, of New York and the nation. He had gone bankrupt running this garden, teaching there, uh, maintaining it, paying labors, and he finally uh, succeeded. The state of New York passed an act. Uh, some people said it should be called the Act for the Relief of Dr. Huzzock, um, but it was in fact called uh, Act for the, uh, for the uh, Promotion of Medicine in the State of New York. Huzzock's garden was to be a public institution, finally, just what he has all, had always dreamed of, and the state renamed it the State Botanic Garden. Several years later, the state realized that it didn't quite have the resources to run a botanical garden and it didn't know anything about it. It gave the garden first to Columbia College and then transferred it to another uh, institution and then back to Columbia. Um, Columbia, a small college at the time, was still located downtown. Columbia was very upset about being given this parcel of land at the heart of Manhattan. 20 acres. Now, it seems like a wonderful gift, but at the time, Columbia had been asking for a loan. They didn't want a botanical garden to maintain. Uh, Huzzock watched the garden carefully. Um, he kept going to committee meetings of the people who had been put in charge at Columbia of the garden. He kept going to the garden and watching its uh, decline. Columbia wasn't interested in maintaining it, and to be fair, they didn't have the money. Huzzock watched in horror as his conservatory, the panes shattered on the floors. The weeds grew up in the paths and the fields and the flower beds. His arboretum, this magnificent collection of forest trees, was ripped out and taken up the island further north to beautify the grounds of the new mental hospital, which Huzzock had helped found, but he certainly didn't want that to come at the expense of his botanical garden. And worst of all, perhaps, the incredible collection of plants that he had collected from all over the world, from the greatest botanists, including Thomas Jefferson, who did begin sending him seeds and plants from Monticello after he realized how serious and successful Huzzock was with this project. Those plants were put on a horse cart and taken down to the city by the so-called caretaker uh, hired by Columbia, and they were sold in a shop like common produce and flowers. Well, Huzzock tried over and over to get the garden back, even though he didn't have the money. He tried on behalf of various institutions he was involved in, and Columbia refused him every time because they were beginning to realize that they had been given what was soon to be a very valuable piece of real estate. The grid here is Hussock's land, uh, now Columbia's, and you can see on the upper left the footprint of his conservatory. Uh, that country lane he used to take up the island, the middle road, was about to be renamed Fifth Avenue as the grid of Manhattan was being mapped up the island. And his, uh, to his southern flank would be 47th Street, and to the north, 51st, and to the west, 6th Avenue. Columbia refused Hussock every time, and finally he gave up, but he kept going to the garden, and I find this rather heartbreaking. In 1829, which is long after the garden had fallen apart, it was barely recognizable as a botanical garden. The hothouse, the conservatory, was a wreck. Hussock went to the garden and collected this specimen of a tree. And it's in his handwriting, Elgin Garden, 1829. And it shows us that 12 years after the garden had completely fallen apart, he still saw this as possibly America's first public botanical garden in perpetuity, if he could only get it back. Well, finally, he gave up. And with the help of his very wealthy third wife, he lost two wives and many children to illness. Uh, as did many people uh, in the late 18th, early 19th century, with the help of his wealthy third wife, who in a bit of poetic justice was uh, the widow of one of his creditors on the botanical garden, he purchased this beautiful estate on the Hudson, which you can still visit today. His house is gone, but it's now uh, the Vanderbilt Mansion National Historic Site uh, near Hyde Park.
And what happened to Hussex land? Well, in uh, by the 1870s, it was blanketed in apartment buildings. Columbia still owned it, and they were earning money from the rent, the leases on this land. In the 1920s, that land caught the eye of John D. Rockefeller Jr. because it was still a single parcel of land, a rarity in Manhattan to have 20 acres intact under one owner. And the Rockefellers had tried to buy the land to build Rockefeller Center. John D. Rockefeller had grown up in the neighborhood and he dreamed in the 20s of creating a, a fast commercial and cultural complex. Um, and then the Great Depression hit. Rockefeller went ahead anyway, and he, he couldn't persuade Columbia's president to sell the land, but he leased 11 acres of it. And he built Rockefeller Center, 14 buildings in all, and Radio City Music Hall sits on the former footprint of Hazek's magnificent world-class conservatory. If you go to Rockefeller Center now, there are a few traces of David Hazek. But before his garden sank into oblivion, both physically in, and in our national memory, Hazek had achieved extraordinary things there. He had trained the next generation of American doctors, not only in how to care for their patients, but also how to conduct scientific research, drawing on what he had learned at the heart of the Scottish Enlightenment in Edinburgh in the late 18th century. He had used his garden to train the first generation of professional American botanists. Before that generation, botanists were either gentlemen like Kazakh or nurserymen, uh, gardeners, horticulturists who are professional men. Hazek helped create a generation of botanists and teachers for whom that was their sole profession. And his most famous student was the botanist John Torrey, who went on to become a pillar of New York uh, botany and teaching at Columbia, and whose uh, students went on to found the great New York Botanical Garden in the 1890s. Isaac used his garden to uh, call for uh, tree planting campaigns for beauty and public health in the city. He used his garden to call for uh, the identification of native species before the continent was overrun by invasives, some, something they were worried about 200 years already, 200 years ago. He conducted some of the first systematic pharmacological research at his garden with his Columbia students. And finally, I, I like to think of him as the original urban gardener because he was uh, at his garden working during the day and then mingling with his cosmopolitan friends, the likes of the Marquis de Lafayette and Alexis de Tocqueville at night. If you go to Rockefeller Center today, there aren't many traces of David Hussack left, um, but there is a plaque. If you turn your back to the old middle road and you face 30 Rock. There's this low plaque. It's often hidden by a bench or tourists. Uh, and the plaque reads, in memory of David Hussack, botanist, physician, man of science, and citizen of the world, on this site, he developed the famous Elgin Botanic Garden. Thank you. So, yeah. Uh Someone asked, so the U.S. Botanic Garden considers itself the first botanic garden established uh, in 1820. Would you consider Elgin to predate that? Um, the, the U.S. Botanic Garden um, is the first botanic garden that survives. Um, Hussack's garden was short-lived. Um, he was friends with um, some of the people who were going on to found uh, the U.S. Botanic Garden, and of course, by any measure, um, the U.S. Botanic Garden is a huge success story uh, compared to what Hussack experienced. Um, and part of that is the, the the early work that, of course, not just Hussack, um, people like Jefferson um, and many botanists in in Philadelphia, in that area, and in Boston, but that generation of founders and the next generation, Hussack's generation, they worked so hard for the cause of American botany. And it was that following generation that founded the USBG. And um, of course, it's 
a glorious institution, one of my favorite botanic gardens, and it's had longevity and um, all that has it couldn't couldn't achieve. And in fact, he when the USBG was being founded, he went down to DC um, and met with people who are involved in it because he had been trying to get Thomas Jefferson to create earlier to create a national network of botanical gardens. And Hussick thought, finally, you know, Monroe is, uh, President Monroe is behind this project and now we'll have this national network. And as far as I can tell from the archives, the DC people were saying, Congress is not gonna help New York out. Don't don't dream. <laughs> so, um, so yes. Uh, of extent, extent gardens, USBG is absolutely the first. Yeah. Um, um, someone wanted to know who provided the plaque to Hasek and how is it maintained at 30 Rock? Um, so that plaque was put in uh, during the, uh, the construction of Rockefeller Center. And um, it turns out that the president of Columbia at the time knew about Hasek's story and uh, absolutely loved it. He he was not, um, he wrote to Rockefeller and he said, to John D. Rockefeller Jr. and he said, sometime when I see you in person, I need to tell you the story of that land. And this is a quote, he said, it reads like a romance. So he really, he really cared about what Hussick had accomplished and found it valuable. And I might add that Columbia had made an enormous amount of money off that land that helps them build their grand campus in Morningside Heights. Um, and the president at the time was acutely aware of that. Today, it's um, it's still maintained, but I, I, I am so excited that Rockefeller Center has done many other, in the last two years, they have replanted the channel gardens, those long gardens that stretch between the plaque and, rock, and 30 Rock with uh, a changing uh, seasonal display that harks back to its uh, former life as a botanical garden. And so now collaborating with the New York Botanical Garden, they've put plant labels in the channel gardens for the first time in 200 years. And there's also um, a restaurant, uh, not run by Rockefeller Center, but across the street on 48th Street called the Elgin. And it is dedicated to David Hussick. Um, and I helped um, pro bono with the decor of that restaurant and its uh, illustrations from American Eden. And they even reproduce a plaque and put it in the sidewalk in front of the restaurant. So that's very fun. That's super fun. Wow. Um, so we had a uh, couple more questions here. Are there any documents of his health findings related to specific plants? Yeah. Um, so great question. I. Um, I often get asked, you know, what did he discover? And um, the answer is that he, you know, one of his great dreams was for this garden was to try to identify native species that would um, obviate the need to import really expensive plants that couldn't grow in the United States, like cinchona bark, that Peruvian bark that he used with Philip Hamilton. Um, and so he was conducting uh, chemical experiments with his students, and there's some material published from that um, by Hosek and his students. And they were doing this painstaking work of trying to um, figure out the similarities and chemical properties. Um, Hosek didn't come up with one kind of single uh, discovery. And I think that's why he's not famous. Um, he, his favorite plant was a plant called bone set, Eupatorium perfoliatum. Um, and he used it instead of Peruvian bark with some good effects, although it doesn't contain quinine like Peruvian bark, so it wouldn't work on certain illnesses. But I think Hussig did something that is kind of unsung. There are many people doing this all over the world, and that is teaching, researching, showing the next generation how to do that work and how to move science forward. And so even though he didn't come out with one kind of life-saving discovery in the plant world, um, he seeded that um, that generation that went on to found USBG and other institutions, both medical and botanical. Thank you. Um, any of his personal or professional materials uh, in a museum anywhere, anywhere that could somebody could go visit and see them? Um, yeah, there. Oh, so one reason it took me so long to write this book is that they're scattered everywhere because he, you know, he wasn't. He wasn't so famous in the 20th century that stuff was collected and put in a museum and an exhibit. Um, 
none of his houses survive. Uh, but there are, so I ended up going to, you know, dozens of archives and there are, um, there are paintings of him at uh, Winter Tour. There's a painting, this is very far away, but the Linnaean Society of London recently uh, got a donation of a painting that had been lost for um, well over a century. And that painting was by John Trumbull and it's of Huzzock. It's the one I showed several times in the garden in, um, in the talk. It's got the garden out the window and that painting, they didn't know in Britain who it was of. It just said portrait of a botanist. And it rec they recently figured out that it was David Hasek, and now it is hanging in the Linnaean Society, looking at the portrait of Carl Linnaeus on the staircase, um, So, which is exactly where Hasek would have wanted it. He studied at the Linnaean Society. Um, so you have to kind of sleuth around, but but there are places uh, to go. That's a, that's a great find. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple more questions. We're getting close to time, but uh, did the Botanic Garden of Padua world's first botanic garden influenced Cossack Garden. Um, he never went to Italy, but he read extensively in the history of um, botany. He brought all these books back from uh, from Europe uh, about botany all over Europe. And he, um, he even would write to his father and say, I need more money for books. And many of these books are now at the New York Botanical Garden in their spectacular Mertz Library. So, um, I would have to go back and see, you know, if he had a book about the, the Padua Garden, but he was certainly reading um, materials that were, were indebted to that garden and, and I'm sure referenced it. Um, that's something that's easy for me to, to look up after the talk, and I will. Um, let's see. Uh, did Hasek ever interact with Native Americans about their use of native plants for medicinal purposes? Um, so this is another question I get often, and it's a really important one. Um, Hasek didn't leave a record of having um, having spoken with Native peoples about their plant use. Um, he drew, however, on the writings of people like the Bartram family, who were very uh, indebted and very um, clear about their uh, debt to Native peoples for um, understanding medicinal plant use. The, I, I never found a reference, a specific reference that showed me that Hasek had ever spoken with any native peoples. One of his, uh, this Eupatorium perfoliatum, which is his favorite plant, he said that he had learned about it from, quote, the country folk of Manhattan, which I think is a wonderful phrase. Um, and they clearly, those country folk had clearly learned about it from native peoples. All right, and uh, what was his connection with Humboldt? Um, so Hasek really admired Alexander von Humboldt, as uh, we all do. Um, he came so close to meeting Humboldt, and it was absolutely heartbreaking, but Humboldt was in Philadelphia and wrote, uh, he was getting his portrait painted by um, Charles Wilson Peel, and he wrote a letter to Hasek saying, I am coming to New York, I want to meet you. And um, then he wrote, uh, he, he wrote and he said, actually, I'm getting a ship. It's sailing. I can't come up. I got to go back to Paris to, to work on my, my travel um, books. And so he never got to the Botanical Garden, which is, I, I think, must have really broken Hussock's heart. But he, in his letter, he promised Hussock, he said, if you want any seeds or anything from Europe, let me know and I'll send them over. And Hussock did indeed have um, had specimens that we think came uh, from Alexander von Humboldt. Wonderful. Well, Victoria, I just want to thank you again for being with us today. This was an amazing hour to spend.